Okay, nobody else is, is in the hall, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to talk about the Absolute Beginner Site, a guide to site building, and it's kind of designers. Um, there's some things that are specific for designers, but the word I want you to focus on is beginner. So this is really kind of beginner site building and how to how to look at it. So just a really quick poll: How many in here are designers? Okay. How about beginners? Just a few. Okay, just hanging out anyway. Okay, so my name is Melissa Miller. I, um, I'm here visiting from Ohio. I work at The Ohio State University. Um, so if any of you work at universities, I'd love to chat with you after. Um, you know, just compare notes and whatnot. Um, I'm originally from Michigan. We get to do the hand. Um, so I'm all about the Midwest, so I was just looking for Midwest-type conferences to come to, so that's why I'm here. Um, a little bit about my uh, career path. So I graduated college in 97. I worked in the printing industry. I started uh, as a print designer. I went into publications, newspaper. I did desktop publishing for many years. Became a photojournalist. Um, I always kind of dabbled in web along the way, but I didn't really, I wasn't really into it that much because you had to do, back then you had to do a lot of work to get an ugly site. And, you know, with the tables and everything. So with the advent of CSS3 and my interest in coding, I've kind of I, I only do web now, so it's kind of it was just the timing thing for me. So, and I only do Drupal really um, at this point. So I've I've only been doing Drupal about two two and a half years. So I'm kind of still a beginner in some aspects, but I'm just kind of getting out of the beginner hump. So this is why I wanted to present this session to maybe, you know, like help you guys like frame it in a way that would help you get started and maybe get off to a quicker start. So that's kind of why I'm here. Here's the statement. I don't, I don't know if it's a factual statement, but this is my observation, is many designers end up as site builders, either on a temporary basis because of the size of the team or whatnot, or, or because they like it. And it's just something that works. Um, and site building is kind of interesting because you can do it UI-based, you can do it code-based, you can do it a mixture of, so you know, there's a lot of crossover on who's a site builder. So, being designers, there's things you already know, so we don't have to go over. Um, and one is you know layout and design, you know HTML and CSS, I hope, um, and then you know um, you know how websites work, you know how the web works. So we don't have to we don't have to talk about stuff like that. We're going to talk about stuff specific to Drupal. So presumably, if you're a beginner, what you don't know yet is how this relates to Drupal specifically. So um, then. How many have seen this? This has been floating around for years. It's like the learning curve for Drupal. Um, I saw this at my first Drupal camp a couple of years ago, and it just kind of stuck with me. And I think in some ways it's true. Um, so I'm still kind of scaling. I'm like maybe about to go under the cliff there. I don't, I'm not sure yet. It's all relative. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, in reality, I think it is more a little bit more like the, the green one. But um, So I'm kind of maybe help you push along a little bit at the beginning there. So um, I have a Drupal motto because everyone should have, you know, mottos for everything, really. Um, so my Drupal motto is there is always more to learn, and that's kind of a life motto in, in general. But so that's pretty easy to grasp. Like that's a thing, right? And but you you got to be okay with this. You got to know that you don't know it, and just kind of go from there. Um, so then I have another one, and this is kind of hits a little closer to home with my personality. Is you don't have to continually start over. Um, if you learn how to do something better, you have to know when to let it go and move on and do it different next time or when to go back. And that's something you might struggle a little bit more with as a beginner. Because there are, there are wrong ways to do it. And in that case, you do want to start over. But, but there are many right ways to do something. So you kind of got to weigh these things. So um, we're not going to necessarily go over this in detail, but just something to keep in mind. And also, there will always be a better way to do something. So even if you are the best and you're doing the best things in the best way, there's a better way. Somebody will tell you. Um, so this is kind of more of an overview. It's not going to be like a demo in any way. But what I hope you'll get out of the session, um, there's two main points. And one is how to divide site building into digestible categories, like how to think about it. And so I'm going to present the way that I think about it. And that may not apply to you, but just kind of as a framework to, to decide. And that kind of leads into the second one. So it's ideas for developing your own site building workflow. Um, feel free to steal mine and add on it or kind of come up with your own. There's a couple categories I haven't touched, which I'll explain why. Um, but anyway, so this 
leading to that, this presentation um, is going to be less of how to do it, more of how to approach it. So like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what to think about next and what to look for, really. Um, so as I kind of touched on, site building can be many things. Um, you, ask, you ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different answers. What is a site builder? What, is it, what do they do? And I think it relates to um, your, your role like in, in your job, what, what products you're using, what, you know, what software, what's your background. Um, and it's kind of a, it can kind of be a catch-all. But I think in the broadest sense, it's someone who builds, builds um, installs, configures sites, um, adds content. So what I've done, though, in, in my head, and this is helpful, and I wish I, well, obviously I didn't know, but I was going to say I wish I would have done this at the beginning, but this is something I've just kind of picked up over the past couple of years, is a way to think about it. So I've kinda, I kind of divide everything into these six categories. Um, admin interface, content creation, content display. Well, I'll, we'll get to those individually, so I won't, I won't read you my slides. Um, but this is my personal way of divvying it up. What I'm going to do is we're going to go through, and in a few minutes we're going to go through each of these categories and give you a tip or two or a module or two that would be relevant in these categories. And it's meant for you to build upon them yourself as you get more advanced, as you have sites that have specific needs. Um, personally, I've worked in the university area for like 12 years now, so most of my stuff is large university sites. There's not a lot of interaction, not a lot. It's not like you know, social media, we have some intranets where there's more that kind of thing. So I, I'm building a very specific site. So what I talk about may not completely apply to you, except, except a lot of these are basics. Um, so that's a starting point. But before we go into the six categories, there are decisions to make before you get started. Um, and there are pretty, a couple pretty big ones. Um, the first one is decide on a theme. And being a designer, this is obviously, you know, a big thing for me like I that's where I start that's how I started in Drupal I started building themes and then I realized I had to learn all the other stuff too and I've actually I kind of enjoy it but I, I started with themes basically um, and, and I'll explain why and themes are intertwined through this whole process and so even if you're not going to start building your theme you have to decide in my opinion you have to decide before you start to build the site you have to plan, build a theme into your planning process. Like what theme are you using, what framework, what regions will you have? Keyword, are there regions? Um, you need to know that moving forward. How many of you were in this room for the last session? A few of you? Okay, I'm also going to promote the Omega Base theme. And um, I've actually also, I'm gonna talk about the same three themes that Dan did, so, um, but just very briefly. So start with a quality base theme, seriously. like. Trust me, um, and pick one, pick one, and master it, and that's like the best thing you can do. I've, I've experimented. Um, I've, I've taken like a one-off kind of theme and hacked it apart, made it my own. Um, it was kind of interesting because I learned a lot how it worked. Um, I also built some from scratch, a responsive theme, just to see if I could, and it, it was okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of going with a base theme. Um, and when I say quality, I kind of mean a popular, well-supported one, because um, they'll always be help for you. Um, so like Dan, I have suggested these three. Um, and I think it's no coincidence when you search for themes in Drupal, these are the first three that come up. So what these are base theme systems. They offer a starter template inside where you can create your own theme. They're all responsive out of the box with some work, as, as Dan was saying. And um, they're all HTML5. So excellent starting point. I say pick one and master it. Um, I've, I've dabbled in the other two, but I primarily use Omega. Um, so then the other big decision, so there's the theme, the other big decision is decide on text editing and media handling. Um, this is really the biggest pain in Drupal, um, especially if you're coming, who's come from another CMS, like a WordPress or, okay, so WordPress out of the box is a pretty decent text editing system, it's easy. I mean. It's easy to you know, enter images, media, stuff like that with very, very little tweaking. Um, Drupal is awesome in so many ways. This is not one of the high points. Um, you have to kind of configure your own text editor. Um, and there's some out there that are pretty easy to go with. You, you, get, you get like the WYSIWYG module. You take like, you know, CK editor, tiny MC. Everything's great. You're out of the box. Um, but then what if you want to do inline images? That's a whole other thing. So that's not really what this is about, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, 
But before you get into that, you have to think about who will be creating content on your site. If it's just you, if you're just making a site for you and you and one other person or just you are the ones entering it, you're, your text editor and your media handling can be a hot mess. It doesn't matter, right? But in most cases, you're creating this site for other people to use and other people to manage content and write on. So therefore, this is a huge decision that you need to make going into it. So I'd say the theme and the text editor um, are the big, two big decisions. And then how will your site handle files and images? I feel like this is re highly related to the text editor um, topic. So I, I like to kind of group them together and make I make like an own, my own custom editor module that contains all these things. Um, okay, so that's the pre-site pre building decisions. Because like, in, you know, in theory, you're supposed to plan your websites before you build them. I, I know that doesn't always happen, but um, you know, and you, you normally you know, plan for content and UI and, and you know, look at research and decide what's best. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it's what you should do. Um, so these are just a couple extra things that you should do in the planning phase. OK, so we good? Any questions on that part? OK, so now we're going to start to go into these each, each of these six major categories. So the first one is the admin interface. And this is, these are kind of like roughly in order um, of how you should do them, but there's a lot of interplay um, back and forth. Um, and the theme is asterisk because, um, well, because like I said, you need to do it at the beginning. It actually plays a big part in the content display as well. But the bulk of the theme, the bulk of the theming, the, the how it looks, the design aspects should come last. But the other aspects of the theme, the theme as in a Drupal theme, should come all throughout there. So that's what that means. Um, OK, so this admin interface. Um, and I just want to say, uh, tips and modules are plural, and I know there's only one thing under there, but it's more of a thing. This is more of a list that you're supposed to be able to add to, so um, don't judge me um, for grammar on that one. Um, okay, so the tips. Use the shortcuts module. It's built in. Um, it's, you know, you don't have to do anything. It's built in. It's turned on, um, and it's helpful. And, and then the other one, um, the other thing I want to talk about is module filter. So I'll just show you a couple slides of these real quick. Um, mo who's using module filter? OK, you should, because it's awesome. And it's, it's just quick. One mod, you just, you just um, install it, and it just works. So, um, so I'll just talk about the shortcuts really brief. This is part of core. It comes turned on by default when you do a standard Drupal installation. Um, if you look at the, where the orange box is circled up on there, there's a little plus button by pretty much any page in the admin interface. And this is um, the 7 theme. It's the default admin theme. I, I, um, I tend to use it on all my sites. I'm comfortable with it. I don't need a separate toolbar or anything. And I've actually asked the people that I work with who, who edit the sites that I build, I've asked them if they would prefer to have a different theme or have the theme that is the same theme as the site, and they all said no. Um, so seven's good. We like it. We're going to stick with it. Um, so whenever you see that plus button, I'm actually hovering over it in this case when I took the screenshot, is this going to add it to your default shortcut set? And then if you look, it's now added to the default shortcut set, and the plus has turned into a minus, and that's the way you can take it away. Um, furthermore, you can manually add um, shortcuts by going to this Edit Shortcut button. You can put a shortcut to anything. It can be off-site, like if you had a Google Doc with like a to-do list or something. Um, I've used it in that way before. The only drawback of this shortcuts module, the core one, is um, I think it only displays seven across the way. Um, it'll, put all, it'll keep all the ones you've put in. It'll just make them inactive. So when you go to edit shortcuts, it will go ahead um, and do that. It'll let you reposition them. OK, so that's shortcuts. Brief. We don't need to dwell on that. Um, the next thing is module filter. So this is what your modules page looks like. Um, those of you who are using Drush may never see this, but most of us who use the UI see this. This is our modules pages. You have to scroll and scroll and scroll. You can collapse these, but yeah, it's kind of a pain. So the module filter is awesome. Um, so what it does is it put, puts things into tabs based on um, uh, group, groupings. I can't remember what they're called, but in the info files of the modules, it has the, the grouping thing. Um, and any module developers that don't fill out that um, field, it just, call, it just falls into the other. So it's kind of nice. You can go through with the vertical tabs. Um, you don't have to scroll through the whole page. The other nice thing is this filter box. So you can filter by name um, in these four states 
of the modules. So highly recommend it. Put it on every site you're using. Super cool. OK. So that's all for the admin interface, because really what I want to do is just touch briefly on each of these categories. And then I want you to kind of go out there and decide what's relevant for you. Um, so the content creation, it's kind of got a little link to the content display, because I, I feel like these are so intertwined. And you can ask me on one day, and I may put something in one category and, and in one in the other. And this is the one it's not fully formed yet. So I'm going to, as of last week, I'm going to show you what these are supposed to be um, in my head. But I'll, I'll handle them separately on here. So content creation. Um, you can read. I won't read the whole thing, because we're going to just go through each one real quick. Um, so content types. Who's, who's, work, who's made their own content types? Super, super easy, right? So out of the box, you get an article and a basic page. Beyond that, you may want to create your own. Um, you can customize the article and basic page by adding fields. Um, or you can delete them all together and, and create your own, um, something that's more portable to get, that you can bring to other sites, which is what we tend to do. Um, in my office. So anyway, you make your own content type. Um, you add fields right there in this drop-down list. Um, these are the fields that come with Drupal Core, or the field types that come with Drupal Core. But there's tons of field types out there. And this is awesome. If you're not, if you're not a coder and you're more of a designer and you want to build a site, this, this interface is fantastic for that. You can just you know, fill in your file things. Um, you know, add a, add a field and then click through. It'll ask you stuff about it. We won't go through that. Just that's really easy. You can you can go through it. But I just wanted to show you the types that are available, and how do you get more? So if this is a very zoomed in shot of the Drupal um, download page where you go to Drupal and download modules, so you see I've selected fields as our module category. There's a whole category um, about that. So, and um, I've also selected Drupal seven and full projects. And if you see, there's 439 modules that are field-related modules um, that come up. So not all of those are going to be field types, but a big, 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 big majority of them are going to be field types. Some are going to be like ways to group fields or just something that is relevant to fields and got tagged that way. But I'd say maybe more than half are actual field types. Um, so yeah, go ahead you know, and go through and, and if you need something specific, go here and look and see if it can give you a field type that you need. Um, so a little bit about that, a little bit about looking at modules on Drupal.org. Um, so this is like, you've probably seen this, this is the bottom of the page, the bottom of a module page, right? And so what do you look for? How do you know if it's worth trying on your site or, or you know, if you want to deal with it um, if, if you don't know the module or if someone hasn't recommended it to you? I typically look at the maintenance status and the development status and see if they're actively maintained or under development. Um, you can look at the date and see when the last time they were updated. If it's been two years, you might not want to use it. But you might. You can try it. It doesn't um, hurt unless it's a production site, but you should never do that. So um, yeah. Anyway, so the next one is um, reported installs. This one has 94,000, almost 95,000. So it's you know, pretty safe bet. It's actively maintained. It's got 95,000 installs. I say this is a pretty safe module to use. Um, I, you can't see it in the screen, but you also want to see a little further up if there's a documentation category, if people have maybe made videos, um, all that stuff that's really helpful to know if it's a module you want to use. Um, one last, a couple more things actually, is you want to see who's in involved in this module. So right now, it's under the maintenance field. Sometimes you'll see it under sponsors or contributors. It'll list a couple people or a couple shops that um, have either donated money or time to development of this module. Um, and then addition, in addition to the main creator of the module, which you'll find back up at the top of the page. And maybe you, you click on that person's name and see what else they've done. Maybe you know them by reputation. So these are just criteria to help you decide if you want to use that module or not. And that's not just for fields. That's just for any module type, really. Um, and I just want to say, as I'm talking, I'm going to be speaking all about Drupal 7. Um, and because that's what everyone's using right now at this, at this point in time. But some of the things are broader, and they some of the broader concepts will relate to you know Drupal 8 and, and beyond, but I think um, all the examples, the specific examples I'll be giving, are Drupal 7 related. Okay, so the next thing 
WYSIWYG. Who's using a WYSIWYG text editor? Okay, there's what WYSIWYG module, there's CK editor native module, I think there's a few others, Drupal 6 had a few others. Um, it's obviously, it's what you see is what you get, right? So it's, it's just a base, it's a way to have all these, you know, text editor program like controls in your text box so you do not have to um, write code, really. Um, and so this is something as a site builder, like I said at the beginning, when you're deciding all this, this is, this is a huge thing. And, it, and again, it depends on who's editing your site. How savvy are they? Um, if you want them to enter image, um, you want to you know, you make it easy for them to understand how to do it. And also, this is where you turn on or turn off buttons. Like, I don't want people on my site to be able to change the background color, change the color, stuff like that. So you, I disallow all that stuff. Um, I let them you know, do bold, underline, italics, bullet lists, stuff like that. I let them see the code if they want to, um, but you can restrict what actually they're allowed to save as the code or what actually gets processed from when they write the code. Little HTML button there. Um, put tables in for data only, I warn. Um, stuff like that. So this, again, is, is highly customizable and it's configured to your environment. If you're the only one editing your site, leave all the buttons on and you can do whatever you want, really. Um, so I, I recommend the WYSIWYG module. I've had fairly good luck with that. I've, like I said, this is kind of the biggest pain, um, at least personally for me, is getting all this set up. So my current setup consists of the WYSIWYG module and Media 2, um, which is listed as unstable, but it's not really unstable. It's just not ready yet, I guess. But there's a talk next, and they'll talk about it a bit more. So I'm going I'm to go to that in the next session. But I found that that worked the best for embedding media into the WYSIWYG editor, into the large box of text, and easy for people to use, and you can reuse images. I'm not going to dwell on that because this is not about that. I feel like that's a little more advanced than this, um, than this site building talk. But I will give you a download, or a link to a download, where you could try out the configuration that I'm using, and if you like it, you can you know, commit to it, tell me to do stuff differently and whatnot. Um, one quick thing about text formats as well is that when you're on your configuration page, there are two areas you need to be conscious of. It's the text formats and the WYSIWYG profiles. This is if you're using the WYSIWYG editor. Text formats will always be there. That's a core thing. And that just lets you define text formats. So by default, it comes with uh, filtered HTML, full HTML, I think. Um, the second one is called. And, but you can have like anything. You can have like Chris's text or something. You can define your own and then you go into the WYSIWYG and then that's where you allow the buttons and, and the tags and you can have CSS classes appear in a drop down, stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty cool, but just kind of remember that there are two different ones because sometimes I'll, I'll go into the WYSIWYG and I, I, I can't do everything I need to do and I realize I have to go to the text format. So that's where you set like allowable tags, like what HTML tags they're allowed to use, stuff like that. Okay, so this is the image field type from core. This is what it looks like. It's a core field type. You put it in, you can do multiple images. It's like a choose file upload kind of thing. Um, this is fantastic if if you do not need to embed images in text blocks, if you do not need to reuse images, um, this is fine and it's great. And, and this is where you have images as separate file fields. Um, so if that's all you need, you're, you're good to go. If you don't, then you want to start looking into the media module. But you can do it as a plugin. I'm actually using TinyMCE, but you can do the media plugin. I think it works with other um, text editor libraries as well. And eventually, essentially, you get the same thing. You get the upload, but you get the library, the My Files. You can add other modules that work with the media module. There's like a YouTube upload, a Vimeo, um, you know, on and on. So it's, it's obviously a bit more robust. And I think they're trying really hard to get to that um, version 2 release very soon. So keep your eyes out. So I have an editor configuration that I use regularly so I don't have to start over each time. And so if you went to GitHub, I, I just did a release today just so there's a tagged version. Um, you can go ahead and download that and kind of use it as a starting point. It's just kind of configured exactly how I would use it. And I didn't, I didn't have time to like go through that in here, but if you had any questions or if you want to use it, I'll actually maybe um, 
put a link to the slides that I had to take out of here for time purposes, which explain this. Um, essentially what this is is exported via features. It's my WYSIWYG, my text editor format, uh, my media handling, and then I wrote a, um, a function for some view modes, and they all work together. Hopefully they all work. So let me know if they do not. Um, I've tried it on two different sites that were not related to each other, and it seems to work. So, um, But anyway, it's just for my you know, time-saving purposes, but you're welcome to, to look around. Okay, taxonomy is your friend. It's awesome. Um, use it, even though if you don't even know what you're doing with it right now. I typically, it can be used for lots of things, and I, especially when you get into more complex views, you can, um, it's tag. It's basically tagging. If you, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a series of vocabulary and vocabulary terms. And in this particular example, I have, I'm embarrassed to say I don't actually have a website right now because I've been so busy building all my work websites for the past year. Um, so I'm kind of building my own website very, very slowly right now. And so I, it's kind of like a portfolio site. So I have these categories, and these are all my careers that I've worked in or whatnot. And so this is like um, a taxonomy field. Um, project type is the taxonomy vocabulary, um, and then the little other, the list are the terms. And what I'm going to do in this case is have this be a hidden field on my project content type, and um, not have it display, but have it there for sorting, for when using views or for other sort of um, sorting purposes. So it's a really, it's a really great thing to do, because um, there is an option, there's a native field where you can have a select list, but you're, but you're limited. Um, so I would say, you never want to use the list, the, the select list. Um, you always want to use taxonomy because you can adjust your taxonomy and you don't have to go in and re-edit that field particular to that content type. You want to, you want to choose term reference and you're going to actually reference your taxonomy and that's going to make the select list for you. I mean, I can't say that enough, so um, just remember. Okay. Um, so yeah, term reference is the content type, and that is default out of the box with core. So what you're going to do, I'm not going to actually walk you through this, but what's going to happen, you're going to select that, you're going to pick the widget. Um, the widget depends on whatever you've chosen in there, it gives you some choices. Um, and then you hit save, it'll ask you to create, and then that's when you choose a taxonomy. So all the taxonomies on your site will show up as available options. Um, so let's pretend like I've done that, and then I go to... Um, the manage display, I've saved this type, I've gone to manage display, and I've dragged it down into the hidden. So it's not actually going to show on my node, but it's there, and it's there on the user side for when a user creates a node. So super handy, try it out. Okay, so taxonomy is kind of one of those things that kind of hover, like, is it a display thing or is it a creation thing? I don't know, it's kind of both. So, you know, just go with that. So content display. Um, I only have one, views, use views. Everyone should use views. Is everyone using views? No? Yeah? Okay. Um, it's awesome. It's going to be in core in the next, in the next um, Drupal 8, the next release. Um, but yeah, so that's all I got to say about that, but we'll, we'll go through a little bit. Um, and then I have some tips for, for kind of for the future, you know, aside from use views, which is the big tip. Um, so I'll just kind of touch on them briefly as I talk a little bit about content display in general. So uh, this is probably the most relevant topic to the title of the session, maybe, beginner site building. So there's just basic content display methods. Um, just kind of want to walk through them real quick, um, ways to think about it. So there's blocks within regions. Um, that's pretty much how Drupal works. You have regions defined in your, in your theme. Um, there are regions defined in core, but in almost all cases, you're going to want to define those in your theme. And that's why you want to choose the theme early, and you want to know what your regions are. You don't have to name them the regular Drupal names. You just name them whatever you want. Um, I, typic I tend to do a base. You know, like I said, I work for a university a department within a university. I, t I do base theme. I have a omega base theme. I do a base theme, and then I put a custom theme on top of it based on the sites. And it just kind of saves time. But, um, and, and, um, it adds consistency. So, anyway, so blocks within regions, we'll talk about in a sec. Node displays, which is when you have a content type and you go to that page of that content type, how does that look? So there, there's a way that you build um, or that you have a display method of content. 
And then the third one is views. So views, pages, and blocks. You can, but like a views, views page is the, the kind of the basic thing, right? So how that page looks. And for those of you who, who don't know, um, views is, is like a query builder. It's a query builder with a UI. So you, you give it criteria, and then it spits out content and displays it, and you, and you tweak how you want it to be displayed. However, there's a whole session on that, so I've decided not to talk about it in depth. But I'll tell you where the session is in a second. So. OK, so just real quick, uh, at the very basic crude level, this is how a Drupal page gets rendered. So here's a page. You have regions, which you've hopefully defined in your theme templates. And then you assign blocks to regions. Um, there is a block called content or main content. And that's where nodes display by default. You don't have to actually, well, you, you say it, but you say it once. Um, but the real question is, where do blocks come from? Um, they come from core. There's, you know, obviously, they toil at the bottom of that list of disabled. And they may Right out of the box, they may put a few in some spots for you. Um, but they come from core. You make your own um, by going to the structure blocks page, add block, little plus button. Um, you can put HTML. You can put text. You can put PHP if you have it enabled on your site, um, anything and you want in there. Typically, on a make your own block, there are things that are static on your site that you don't want other people, that other people do not need access to edit. This, these are like maybe fixed elements, like maybe uh, your address and your footer, um, stuff like that. Um, menus. Um, well, we'll talk about that. So everything else you kind of want to keep as, as nodes, but you can have nodes be spit out as blocks by views. So uh, yeah, a, no, a content type. OK, so content type equals node. So a, a node is an instance of a content type. That's better. That's a better way to say it. So an article uh, is a node. So you make an article that's titled something. It gets a node ID, and that's a node. Um, page is also a node. OK. All right, so the other way is views. Views can make blocks. And um, other modules can make blocks. Either by default of enabling that module, it has blocks that it spits out, or as a function of that module. So I know that's very, very general, and, and it's meant to be. It's meant for me for me to say, hey, these are the way you can get blocks. Go look up how to do them. Um, that's kind of the point, because we only have like an hour. So, um, Beyond the scope of today's talk, I just wanted to throw a few other things out there to, to look for in the future. Once you kind of understand this concept of blocks and nodes and regions and all that, you want to look at more advanced ways to display these. And so I'm going to throw out like three names of things. Context. Um, is the one I use. It's not just for display in blocks and regions, uh, um, but I, I use it in that way. And it works awesome with the Omega module. It, it ties in. There's, there's a kind of a connector module um, delta that also kind of makes that all work together. Um, panels I've dabbled in. Um, I, I preferred context personally. Um, panels is a way to do that as well. Um, it's a little more robust, but less flexible in context, because context you can do other things in as well. And then Display Suite. Who, is anyone using this? It's pretty big. It's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, At the very basic, you can define view modes, um, stuff like that. But you don't need all three. You, you need one of these. So in the future, once you get beyond the basics, kind of look into these. Um, again, I don't know how relevant any of these will be in eight, but for now, uh, the next year or two, as you're building sites, I'd recommend checking out one of these, seeing one, deciding on one that's best for you, and, and kind of go with it. Um, along the same lines, I'm going to show you a node display, how you do it now, and then maybe how you want to do it moving forward. So uh, nodes, we've created the node earlier. We've, we've Add the, added the fields, and that would be under the Manage Fields tab, which is the second tab at the top. The next one over is Manage Display. And we talked about it briefly in that, in that taxonomy. Like where you, we, This is the same picture where we hid the uh, field. This is just a way to display all your fields for nodes. And, and this is the time where you can hide things. Like It gets entered on the form when someone creates the node, but it doesn't get displayed when the node is displayed. Um, you know, you can have tons of fields here. And this is basically a UI to create the field. Um, in, this play, in this view, you're, you're, um, you're deciding the rendering order of these. 
and you have a basic node rendering template that comes with Drupal, a template file, and it says, hey, I'm rendering what this is telling it to render. Um, so you don't have as much control. But if you, if you know CSS, you can kind of shush it around um, and just have it spit out in order the way you want it. Um, some fields, like you see this image field, have this little gear icon where you can set more um, preferences inside that. You can um, have predefined image sizes and go and tell it, I want it to display a medium image or something. So you do have a lot of control in here, um, but you don't have full control. The alternative, um, if, you, if you know CSS, or if you know HTML, I mean, rather, and a little bit of, little bit of PHP, you can actually go in and edit the node template file. You'd, you'd actually create your own version of it um, that resides in your theme, in your theme folder. Um, and the one you want in this case is node TPL PHP. It's essentially, it's essentially HTML with some, some PHP sprinkled through. And I recommend if you're using a base theme, you grab the node TPL from your base theme, make a copy, throw it into your sub theme. Um, and this applies to any of the stuff. I don't really want to get too in depth in there. Um, even up to field, which is not even showing here. And you can also um, define it based on a specific node, like a node instance, like node number two has this, or a node type. Um, we're not going to talk about it, just know it exists. So it's a good way to do it. I like to do a combination. OK, so in the, in, you know, in the effort to save time, and because this already exists, go to this. It's the next session. It's intro to views. Beginner is all about views. If you're, if you're not using it, I recommend this. I, I don't know tests, but I'm. You know, I think it's going to be good, so I think you should go. OK, so therefore, I can skip views. Um, next one. I apologize if I'm talking too fast. I have to, um, I had to cut a little bit out. I'm trying to get everything in. So the next category is navigation. So menus, I guess. To me, this means menus. It, it can mean other things, I guess. Um, um, so I just kind of have one tip for this. and it, and it uses the module that I suggest as well. So you want to use the menu blocks module. Um, you're going to use the Drupal core menu module to create your menus, but you want to use the menu blocks module to display it. And that's what it's meant for. It basically gives you a little more control over um, how, men how menus are displayed. You can reuse them. You can export them as code. You can um, have them start at varying levels um, based on what page you're on. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so again, it's a little, little, slightly more advanced. It's not super hard to figure out, but just know that it exists and try it. So what I typically do by default is I turn off, or I just don't even use the, the, the Drupal um, primary menu and secondary menu. I just turn those off, and I make all my menu through menu blocks. And they're made through the block um, interface. So it's awesome. Try it. OK, so that was that category very, very briefly here. Um, people. So I'm just going to skip right here. So there's a couple things. There's a lot of things you can do with the people. And, and, and in my head, people relates to um, anything dealing with user accounts and anything dealing with the people menu tab up in the uh, up in the main admin menu, and that would be permissions, roles, stuff like that. So I kind of group people into those two things. And then also um, profiles, which is kind of part of the user thing. So in my head, those three things kind of fall into this people category. Um, I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. Um, it doesn't get its own slide, so I'm just going to throw out this real name. It, real name. It's a module. Real underscore name, I think, is the project name. and. Basically, it lets you, it adds a couple fields, and it uses, I, th I believe it relies on tokens. It uses tokens, and you can have people's real name. You can have people have real, their real name, first and last, and a separate user account. And they all get tied back to the user variable based on the configuration you set. So you don't have to have them create separate fields. It's pretty cool. Check it out. Um, I use it for my user profiles, because we all at um, Ohio State, we have, we're kind of assigned serial numbers. Um, and you know, that's my. My Miller.26776 is my serial number, and I just kind of stuck. Um, so we, we um, use everyone's user accounts or their serial numbers as their thing, and we want their real names to be able to display on articles and their user profiles and stuff. So we use the real name module. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few other things. So um, unless you're making a site that you want random people to 
to join. Um, you want to put it on administrators only or visitors, but administrator approval is required. Otherwise, you're going to get tons of spam. You're still going to get it with the one I um, checked, but they won't actually get an account on your site. I'm just, I just get a bunch of email. Um, However, if, um, so if you want a closed site and you don't want a bunch of people joining and you just want to give people accounts, you want to check that top one. And uh, I think this third one is on by default, so that's why I'm pointing it out. And if for some reason you are creating a site, for example, like a commerce site where you want people to create accounts, um, then you have to take an extra step and add like a CAPTCHA or something on it. Um, so just pointing it out. Okay, so this is the permissions page. And it scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. And there's lots of permissions. And you can check these at the beginning. You can check them whenever. But I typically check these kind of near the end, right, as I'm about to let people start having user accounts. Because what, what happens is every time you add a content type or a module, it creates more permissions. So I tend to do it um, near the end. But that's just my preference. So OK. So, um, then there's the theme. So, I know we talked about a little bit at the beginning. Also, in theory, we're designers, so we shouldn't have to talk about it too much, but I'm just going to go over a few things again. So, um, master a base theme. Um, the three I mentioned are awesome, um, I think. Omega is awesome for sure. And, you know, if there's any other suggestions, no? Um, and then there's, I have these four modules listed. There's, there's tons more that you could use that I consider related to the theme layer, but that's a whole other, like theming is like a whole other thing. Um, but I just wanted to throw these out there, and they kind of fall in the two categories. The first two are block class and browser class. And what they do is they add classes, um, but you can define them through the UI. Well, for example, browser class, actually, you don't even need a UI. Um, browser class is an interesting module. I've only needed it on one site because um, I had a lot of strange positioning things that looked different on other sites. Um, typically, you don't need it. But what it does, once you enable it, it detects the browser the people are using, um, the actual browser and the version, and sometimes the build. And it actually just adds those classes into the body, into the list of body classes. So for example, on my crazy site, I had like certain versions of Firefox were not recognizing a negative margin or something. And so I had to take and you know, make a conditional class using that. And so it's pretty cool. So you don't have to do a conditional style sheet. It's just classes for specific things. So I'd recommend checking that out. It's, it's, very, um, it's very easy to use. It's you know, not heavy. Um, the other one is block class, and that um, you, if there's a UI for it. So anytime you create a block or a menu block even, any, any sort of block that you can edit through the block interface, you can add classes to it um, through the UI. And so the alternative to this would be to create a block TPL file for like specific blocks, um, which I tend to do for pages, but I don't do it for blocks because it's just easier to just do it right through the UI and it doesn't happen as often as, a, as for content types, at least personally. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of, there's a, there's a whole category of modules out there that kind of add classes and they alter class. Um, the content module also does a similar thing. You can, it's based on conditions. So you say if, if this path is this or if, this text, if it has this taxonomy, it, it do this. And, and one of the conditions is you can have it add body classes that you define. Um, so it's cool. You can do a lot of stuff like that. The other two are... Um, uh, how to handle images and videos with a responsive theme. Um, and there's a couple out there in each category, and these are the two that I find that work pretty well. Um, the FitVids is, is, a, is basically a JavaScript library. Uh, the, the Drupal module is just the interface for that JavaScript library. And it just shrinks videos as you, you know, shrink your page, go to different page sizes. Um, adaptive image. Um, I found it's, I, I think it's the one Dan mentioned the last time, I'm not sure, but I find it to be the easiest of those adaptive image modules. You don't need to install anything on your server. Um, it actually, they ha you can actually use, um, enter it as one of the categories in image styles, and you just define your breakpoints. Um, so there's no separate JavaScript, there's no separate server on that one. And so far I haven't found where it doesn't work. So there's that. So. 
that was the basics. So beyond this, what's next? I already kind of explained you may want to look at some of those advanced layout modules. You, you may want to start you know, experimenting with the TPL files. Um, and then um, you also want to expand and personalize each of the six categories. Or maybe you have different categories. You notice I didn't talk about security or performance um, because I have someone else that handles that for me. But maybe you handle that as part of your site building. So you, you might want to add that category or more of like a developer or an admin type category. But I find you know, site building, it's easier to grasp if you have it kind of categorized like that rather than here's Drupal, build something. And it's just crazy. And you don't know that you don't need these two modules that actually do the same thing and stuff like that. So, um, so I've kind of, I found this systematic approach kind of works for me. Um, next thing is who, who's using features? Look it up. It's a, OK, you. you could can you vouch for how amazing it is? It's very amazing. Yes. Yeah, so, so what you want to do is, is you want to learn features. It's, it's a module, but it, essentially, you kind of it lets you export things as features. They're, they're, they're pretty much modules. Um, and after they're exported, you can actually write additional functions into them as if you were writing your own modules, or you can just have it kind of export. Um, so how I use it typically is like the text editor module that I gave you the link for is a feature exported with, a, with an additional function written in there. Um, content types. So if you have content types on your site and you want to move it to a different site, you just export it as a module. Um, and so what I tend to do is building, when building a new site is I immediately go in and get rid of the article on the basic page. I rename them with my naming conventions and make the same ones and start from there. And then I'll make whatever else I need. And then I'll export each of those as modules. And then features, um, well, and then you know, using Drush, or you can actually manually code this, you can actually make install profiles. And then you can treat these features exported modules just like you would any other module. So your site is portable in code. You, I mean, you still have to move the database of your content, but you don't have to move your database of configuration. So essentially, features let you export a lot of your configurations as modules. So if this doesn't make sense to you now, it's no worries, because this is a beginning thing. It's just kind of like, what do you do in the future? This is my recommendation for what you should do. Um, and I've timed this pretty good, I guess. Um, we have 15 minutes left, if you have any questions. Yes. Um, I am, I'm depending on the theme. Oh, oh the, the question was, am I, am I depending on the theme to create platform independent? Within this, within this design, is there a place where you're specifically acting, being able to work on mobile or desktop? Or are you kind of relying on the theme for that? I'm, I'm relying on the theme. Um, and, and, and in my case, I use the Omega theme. And um, I haven't come to a, um, a problem with that yet. I'm not opposed to looking outside um, if, if, it, if that ever happens. But um, I use the Omega Base theme. I'm actually using Omega 3. Omega 4 just came out a couple months ago as, as their re recommended release. I haven't switched to that yet. Um, but I'm using Omega 3, and it comes with um, responsive, mobile first, out of the, out of the box. Um, you can define conditional style sheets um, for IE. Um, there's actually a separate module that you can turn on, or you can just write it into your code and into your into the head of your HTML template. Um, so you can define conditional things like that, and then the HTML template is actually also where you would put any sort of web fonts or anything like that. Um, yeah. So I'm using primarily the theme right now. So. Any other questions? No. All right. Cool. Well, you get 15 minutes back. Awesome. Oh, okay. Keep going. Why do you like the Drupal Oh, did I say that or did you see that up there? Okay. Oh, um, I think I think what happened in this case and some of the pictures I've shown is I have field group module in my install profile, so it got in there. I'm not actually using it on that site I showed you. But I have a site, one of my work sites is actually a help site. And 
it has tabs, like um, tab-based. And so the field groups module lets you set up tabs. And it'll let you do accordions, tabs, or vertical tabs. And the, that particular module, because you can always display things as tabs, but that particular module lets the form that the users enter also have tabs. So that's, that's why I use that. So I think it's just kind of in my default install profile, and that's why I was there. So it's cool. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs>